is part 15 of a series about complex arithmetic. My name is Bill Kinney. In recent videos, we've focused on relations uh, between the, the modulus and argument of complex number, that is the product of two other complex numbers specified by these equations. We focused on the polar form of a complex number and the relationship between that polar form and these properties up here, especially focused on the multiplication usually. We introduced something called the cis function. As shorthand, cis of theta represents cosine of theta plus i sine theta. It's a natural shorthand to use, cis being the letters here, cosine, i, and sine, first letters in cosine and sine. But ultimately, we're going to represent complex numbers in polar form, more commonly using the exponential function. And in fact, if I've got a complex number, z equals x plus i, y. I will more commonly represent that as r times e to the i theta power, where r is the modulus of z, and theta is an argument of z. We could also therefore write this in terms of this notation. There's the modulus of z, and then I can use arg z for an argument of z. So this is going to be our more common way of using it. In fact, we will hardly ever come back to cis anymore, other than just in this introductory few videos. Euler's formula uh, is what allows you to, to represent a complex number in polar form in this way. And again, I didn't derive Euler's formula. I mentioned, since I'm following the Saff and Snyder book, that you can derive it using Taylor series for e to the z, cosine z, and sine z, at least if you accept those series representations and the manipulation of them. Um, but it is definitely an important formula to know and be able to use, and here are our fundamental properties written in terms of polar coordinates involving e, the exponential, e to the z, the exponential function. What I want to focus on in this video is an application of Euler's formula to something called, I might be pronouncing this wrong, de Mauvray's formula. I'm not quite sure if I got that right, but I think it's right, or close at least. And that involves raising a complex number to a power. So let's look, go back up here to Euler's formula. And in fact, let me imagine taking e to the i theta and raising it to a power. And just like in the last video where you were trusting me about, well, in this video too, where you're trusting me about Euler's formula coming from a formal manipulation of Taylor series, I'm ask, also going to ask you to trust me with something here. I'm going to think about raising this to the n power, where here initially you might imagine n to be a positive integer. If you were, you were just formally manipulating this and not worried about whether it definitely works or not, or wh why it's true, what would you do? Hopefully you recall from your pre-calculus days that when you've got a situation like this, e to a power raised to another power, that you can multiply those exponents, you can multiply those powers. So I claim that that can again be done. We can take i theta times n and get i times m theta. Let me make this brighter again. And that that is a true equation. Okay, that's, that's my claim. You're going to trust me on this, okay? I, I'm not going to prove this right now. I'm not sure if I'm going to prove it in any of these videos. It definitely is something that can be done. You can look it up, uh, how to derive this. I hope that you, you trust me on it. If you now think about this second expression in terms of Euler's formula, it would then equal cosine of n theta plus i sine of n theta. All this comes from is using Euler's formula and replacing the theta with n theta make that replacement. But there's something else I can do back over here. I can think of e to the i theta to the n power as this thing to the n power. In other words, this thing equals this thing. And that is not obvious especially 
if you're not thinking at all about Euler's formula. Even if you are thinking about Euler's formula, perhaps it's still not obvious that this would be true. But it is. When you have cosine theta plus i sine theta and raise it to an n power where, if, let's just say for example, n is 3, that's going to equal cosine of 3 theta plus i sine 3 theta. It's kind of interesting if you think about it. You're relating some trig functions with a certain period and frequency, the period over here being 2 pi, to some other trig functions that have a different frequency if We've got the n there, n times theta, the period is going to be 2 pi divided by n. That's not, that shouldn't be obviously true. It's got some neat applications. Let me show you how to use Mathematica to think about these neat applications. Well, maybe I should do it sort of by hand, so to speak, to, to begin with. Let's imagine thinking about what this in the case where n is 3. So we claim that this is true. By the binomial theorem, I can modify this thing on the left even further. It's a binomial cubed. You can apply the binomial to say that that is, binomial theorem to say that that is going to be the the first thing cubed, cosine theta cubed. So I'll go ahead and cube this plus three times the first thing squared times the second thing if you don't remember the binomial theorem here you might want to look it up pause the video come back after you've looked it up oh I wish it would just keep it red plus three times the first thing times the second thing squared plus the second thing to the third power. I guess I have it over here. All right. Let's uh, continue rewriting this. Maybe I'll put it on a different line here. Let's simplify. What do I mean? I mean, for example, in the second term, let's bring the i out in front here initially, like this. With this term, i is being squared, so it's going to be a negative 1. Make, that, make it a negative sign here. Get rid of the i. Make this a square in here. Get rid of the square out here. And let's make everything red. Oops, it didn't work on this one, huh? I'm not sure why. Okay, oh, I got this one. All right, <clears throat> one more rearrangement. Well, my equal sign still black. I'll leave it. One more rearrangement. Let me group together the real parts that don't involve an I and the imaginary parts that do involve an I. And oh, I, I should have done one more simplification. I've got an I cubed here. I squared is negative 1, so I cubed is going to be negative I. Thank you for changing that to black. Hope you're enjoying my trouble here with the red and black. So, what's the punchline here? Hopefully I haven't made a mistake. Let's see, I'm trying to rearrange things. Here's another term. These two, This term and this term involve I. So, let's copy this. And this is supposed to be a sine cube there, another mistake. Maybe you're going to want to rewatch this and slow it down and take notes. What's the punchline in all this? That's what I'm trying to get to now. 
The punchline is I've now rearranged things so that the real part is of this uh, expanded thing from the binomial theorem is right there, and the imaginary part is right here. It's equal for all values of theta to this thing. In other words, the real part of this thing must equal the real part of this, and the imaginary part here must equal the imaginary part here. In other words, we really have, have derived a couple of trig identities from this. One of them being, focus on the real parts, that cos 3 theta equals this thing here on the left, and the other being that sine 3 theta equals the imaginary part over here is this right here. And this is the punchline, is these two equations are derived as nice applications of de Moivre's formula. Oh, it didn't turn it blue. Why, why, why? Blue. I don't know why. These are nice applications of de Moivre's formula, and we can check them with Mathematica through trig expand. Hopefully it'll put them in the same form. Trig expand cosine 3 theta, look at that, equals cos cubed theta, which means cosine of theta quantity cubed, minus 3 cos theta times sine squared theta, which means sine of theta quantity squared. And if I do the same thing with sine of 3 theta, there we go, we've confirmed the other equation. So we've expanded these trig functions with a, frequent, with a period of 2 pi over 3 and a frequency of, frequency of 3 over 2 pi in terms of trig functions and powers of trig functions that have a period of 2 pi, a frequency of 1 over 2 pi. Kind of interesting, it's a nice application. You can do this, by the way, for higher powers of n besides 3, and it's, a, again, a nice way of deriving these formulas.